David, could you introduce yourself? Uh, David Griggs, uh, the director and curator of the Carpentry Valley Museum of History. And let's start off with, tell me uh, about incorporation, the city incorporating. Uh, well, it officially was recognized by the state. Official incorporation was September 28, 1965 after a fairly long and contentious um, uh, debate running up to the election uh, that was held in uh, a week prior to that time. There had been an attempt at incorporation, I think maybe around 1962 or so. Um, it was not well received. Uh, the city boundaries were very uh, large, incorporated a lot of the agricultural areas. So, um, many property owners that did not want to be annexed into a new city voted against it. Um, the city boundaries then were uh, reduced quite a bit to, I think, 1.3 square miles. Uh, that's what was proposed in the 1965 election. And um, that's what ultimately passed. Turn it off for a second. Um, do you, can you tell me what the arguments in favor of and against incorporation were? Uh, well, there were many. Um, the typical argument against incorporation, I think, stands today in most places uh, that folks were worried about um, another layer of government uh, and another tax. They were worried about property tax. They maintained that the size of the city um, was not sufficient to uh, really support the services that were being promised and that ultimately uh, city council would vote to um, to levy a city tax on properties uh, which was legal incorporated cities are allowed a, a, I think back then um, it was a dollar per 100 uh, dollars of assessed value of a property uh, the Is that a dollar per 100 for the year Yes, yeah. Oh, yes, okay. yeah, every year. So um, so the anti-incorporation felt, uh, first of all, many of them felt happy with the county uh, level of governance. Um, the county kind of really stayed out of everybody's hair and everybody was worried that uh, a new city government would have more um, planning and, and zoning uh, restrictions, et cetera, which was also an argument in favor of incorporation. Uh, the pro-incorporation people really were uh, anxious for local control, and that's really what it was all about, is why well, have five county supervisors, only one that represents the district, um, making decisions. Uh, and with regard to planning, I think there was nine planning commissioners on the county um, and only a couple would represent the Carpinteria Valley. So you have people in Lompoc and Santa Maria deciding what will and will not be built in the Carpinteria Valley. So local control was, a, was the big issue, I think, uh, in favor of incorporation. And with that would come expanded um, services, you know, the things that are important to everybody. You know, there's a pothole in front of my street. A city's more responsive to that than the county government. Uh, they wanted tax dollars that are generated in Carpinteria to come back and pay for improvements in Carpinteria. And under the county um, government control, uh, that wasn't happening. So greater police protection, cleaner beaches, um, street sweeping, uh, street lights, curbs, gutters, really infrastructure that that locals didn't feel the county was adequately providing. So, um, so uh, David, do you know what the final vote was? I believe it was 895 in favor and 635 against. Huh. So not that far apart. Not that far apart. Um, that was just, and of course, the, the people that were voting uh, just within the proposed new city limits. Did, do you know if it created hard feelings at the time, the, the issue? Uh, it definitely divided um, neighborhoods and households. I mean, you know, there, there can be, uh, I don't know if it parted the sheets in any households, but uh, there was so many compelling reasons for incorporation, uh, many of which have been borne out with, with, uh, through the city's uh, good works. Um, and there was just as 
as many concerns and, and fears about another layer of government and more taxation, which eventually did come to pass in a few years. I think the first city property tax levied was about 61 cents per $100 of assessed value. Um, following the catastrophic 1969 floods, uh, with all the damage, it was up to a dollar, which was the maximum amount. Um, but I, I think that people remain friends. Uh, one of the most vociferous um, anti-incorporation voices was Ernest Woolbrandt, um, who ironically was one of the top five vote getters, uh, was elected to the first city council, uh, ended up serving as mayor two or three times or and city councilman for over 20 years. He became one of the biggest advocates working for the city of Carpinteria and yet leading up to the vote and he himself voted against incorporation. So, um, so I, I don't know that hard feelings lasted for a long time. I think that the city really came through on a lot of the promises that were made and people felt um, comfortable and eventually came to really appreciate local control. Did you know Ernie Walbrand? So I knew Ernie very well. He, uh, Tell me what type of guy he was. Um, he was an interesting sort of guy. Uh, old Ernie, he was, he was a busy, hard-working guy. He was always working. Uh, he was a plumber by trade and had his shop right next to the museum here, so he was kind of an over-the-back fence uh, neighbor. Um, he was very friendly towards me. He offered to take me up to his ranch uh, up the Chismahu Road uh, a number of times. Um, never took him up on his offer, sorry to say. He was, I think he was the ultimate um, civic booster. He was always videotaping long before you came on the scene. It was Ernie Woolbrandt that was any, any fire, any flood, any disaster, any winning football game, Ernie was filming it. Uh, and had a tremendous uh, 16 millimeter uh, film library of, of events and parades and, and anything to do Carpinteria. He truly was Mr. Carpinteria. Uh, yeah, tell me about the film again. Well, Ernie uh, had really amassed a, a huge uh, film library of events and um, uh, of, around Carpinteria, and he generously loaned a lot of his footage to uh, KEYT Television, uh, Channel 3 in Santa Barbara. Um, subsequently, that was misplaced, lost, thrown away, we don't know. Uh, this is an opportunity, those of uh, people viewing this video, um, if they have any idea, if anybody's come across old 16 millimeter film that has uh, something like a Loyalty Day parade in 1978 in Carpinteria, you know, uh, folksy things. Um, Ernie was filming everything, not just big disasters, although KYT probably was borrowing things for major things like the oil spill or the uh, Romero Canyon fire, things like this that Ernie was um, not only filming, but he often was right on the front lines um, volunteering. Uh, in, in efforts to suppress or, or help victims or anything. Ernie was like that. He was always right in the trenches. But um, a lot of these films have been lost. I, I know that Ernie's son, uh, John Wilbrandt, uh, has recently uh, recovered or found um, an archive of Ernie's films, and I'm excited to view those at some point. But out there somewhere are, are a lot of important uh, films of Carpenter's history that um, we know we certainly would like to get back. Tell me about the museum, David. Well, the museum itself is about as old as the city. The Historical Society actually incorporated as a nonprofit um, prior to the city's incorporation. So in 1959, the Carpenter Valley Historical Society incorporated as a 501c3 nonprofit. They immediately started laying plans to uh, build an in town museum. They had um, some exhibits at the historic Baylord Home, uh, ranch home out off Baylord Avenue, but that was far out of town, and the dream to build a museum um, was started to be realized in 1965, right at the time of city incorporation, is when ground was broken on this property here at 956 Maple, which is actually three county lots. 
um, First District uh, Supervisor C.W. Uh, Bradbury, for whom Bradbury Dam is named, uh, secured these county lots for the Historical Society. He was on the board of directors, the first board of directors of the society. And so in 65, they broke ground on the museum. Um, it was a long process, as things are back then. Lots of fundraisers, bake sales, rummage sales, um, donations, membership drives to raise the funds. And the museum actually was built in stages over the course of about four to five years um, as monies became available, but was built debt-free and completed and, and open uh, regularly to the public in uh, late 1969 and early 1970. Is there anything else you'd like to tell me? Uh, well, the, the museum at, at that point was just a, a couple of small um, exhibit galleries. What is now the research library was actually um, leased to the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce office was here at the museum, so that provided a little cash flow for the Historical Society. It's an all-volunteer organization. Um, it took uh, CETA grants in the in the mid-1970s before the society had enough uh, cash to hire a part-time curator. And once that happened, then the museum really started uh, rising uh, to the level of, of professional curation um, and conservation of its collections. Uh, the, ex the collections have grown in leaps and bounds. The um, museum went through a major expansion, 1985 to 86, when a second wing was built. Uh, more than doubling the size of the museum to over 5,000 square feet. Um, and uh, new exhibits were added, new programs were added for the schools. Um, uh, membership expanded quite a bit during the building fund drive. The community really got on board to support uh, this museum expansion. And it's uh, at that time in when it was just completed in 86 is when I was hired and we've been kind of growing and, and going ever since. C can you tell me uh, what collections there are and what type of research material is here? Uh, that's that's going to have a long multifaceted answer, Larry. Uh, um, well, there are major archives here. There's a photograph archive of over 8,000 photographs, which are all indexed and cross-referenced. Um, there's a subject archives with uh, memorabilia and ephemera and newspaper clippings on hundreds of topics relative to Carpinteria history, everything from disasters to agriculture, to agricultural commodities, um, early uh, historic periods, um, Hispanic periods, the Chumash Indians, of course. Uh, then in the major collecting areas, we do have um, a, a archaeological collection of Native American Chumash artifacts and, and certainly a major exhibit on, on their culture. Uh, we cover the um, Hispanic mission to Mexican Rancho period of California history. Uh, we then get into the um, the American period in California statehood, uh, agriculture, um, military collections, uh, in early industries like the asphalt mining and oil industries, um, obscure industries like uh, raising ostriches or, or uh, perfume roses, uh, the pampas grass. Um, so we're really covering all the aspects of carpentry history and the collections there, of course, are household objects, Victorian, uh, farming objects and implements, um, uh, early school days, uh, really all the utilitarian objects that the various cultures that have lived in the Carpentier Valley would have needed to survive here are represented in our collections. Uh, tell me about the oil spill. Well, you had mentioned um, oil spill and flooding, and I think uh, to go in the proper timeline and sequence, uh, the flooding occurred first. Um, the period of in January of 1969 uh, was the main flooding uh, period in the Carpent in, in Carpentaria's 50-year history. We've had subsequent floodings in 78 and 83 and 88, but the big flood, the 100-year flood, was uh, January 23rd through the 26th in 1969. It had been raining since the 19th um, of January that year. 
Uh, then torrential downpours came where we were getting over an inch an hour, sometimes for six to 12 hours straight. Um, so that by January 26, all the creeks had, uh, had risen in, uh, to flood stage, had um, jumped their banks um, from Toro Canyon to uh, Santa Monica to Franklin to Carpenter Creek to Rincon Creek. So the entire valley was flooded. All the low-lying areas lay under several feet of water. I think the county, county-wide in that period, um, by the end of January, had received something over 40 inches of rain. And of course, some of those measurements are, you know, the high, higher mountain elevations that get the most. Um, and then two more storms hit in February. So that by the end of February, in some places in the county, over 70 inches of rain had fallen. Now, in Carpinteria itself, uh, one of the hardest hit of, in all of Santa Barbara County. Um, Lompoc, downstream of the San Inez River, and Carpinteria were the two um, major disaster zones. Uh, Mayor Alan Coates declared a disaster um, at the end of the January storm. Uh, President Richard Nixon followed up by declaring the entire county a disaster area. The Army Corps of Engineers were brought in to help remove flood debris. Um, even the National Guard was brought into Carpinteria and Lompoc both uh, to prevent looting because all services were, were cut off. Um, the freeway north and south of Carpinteria were cut off. There was a death um, from a, a young man in a pickup truck that the uh, northbound, or actually westbound, uh, Highway 101 bridge over Carpenter Creek, the soil abutment leading up to the bridge. People say the bridge washed out. The bridge remained, but the soil abutment leading up to the bridge on, uh, on the freeway northbound um, was eroded as, as Carpenter Creek uh, destroyed that in the pickup. Uh, the young man drove right into the floodwaters and was killed. Um, up Lillingston Canyon, uh, the Pinkham, Milton uh, Pinkham home, was completely lifted up and washed downstream at least 150 yards or so with uh, Gail Pinkham and her three children inside the house. Uh, this was like about 6 a.m. in the morning, just a roar and a rush. All survived. Um, even their pony survived, but everything else, the house was destroyed. Uh, Carpinteria was, was cut off um, from the outside world for a while and so getting food in was a problem and it really kind of mirrored the the uh, historic flood of 1914 where a whole trains were left stranded in Carpinteria and and horse um, trains were organized people bringing food from Santa Barbara uh, across the swollen creeks into uh, Carpinteria just so people could survive I think in 1969 um, here at least a thousand people uh, were left homeless, some temporarily, uh, but over a thousand were evacuated and homeless, could not return to their homes, and so had to be housed um, in, in emergency shelters, community church, Red Cross was brought in. It truly was a, a major, major natural disaster. Did, did President Reagan come to that one, or did he come to some other flood? I believe there's a... Uh, well, uh, Reagan was governor of the state, at the time. So Nixon was, Nixon was president and declared, uh, ultimately I think the entire state was declared a disaster area because uh, the torrential rains uh, certainly affected much more of Southern California than just the south coast of Santa Barbara County. But with our geography, with our high mountains dropping so dramatically and so quickly to the sea and with the uh, confluence of uh, high tides and storm surf there was no ability to drain these waters away and that that really increased the flooding. Uh, the high school was under several feet of mud. The entire high school was was filled with mud and the the, the um, sunken amphitheater at the high school which is still there I believe uh, was completely filled in um, uh, old town was flooded. Remember, Santa Monica Creek and Flank Franklin Creek were not channelized. It was because of the 1969 flood that these these creeks later were were channelized and lined with concrete to uh, allow faster movement of floodwaters. So the natural creeks, the natural debris built up and built up against the uh, bridges, um, like the 8th Street Conchaloma Bridge, which the creek completely washed out uh, a, a side of that. 
um, just changed its course. It, it was a devastating time. Could you mention uh, President Reagan, came, uh, Governor Reagan came? Well, I don't know much about his particular visit. I know that he, he did visit Santa Barbara County and, you know, and, and also pledged you know, any state support that was necessary um, to help. But um, I'm not really up on any facts of, of Reagan's visit uh, to Carpinteria in specifics. Uh, do, do you know when the creeks were channelized and, and how that's worked out? Uh, well, I think that Santa Monica Creek was the first. It, it's a lar much larger watershed. Um, and I think that immediately after the 69 flood, the Army Corps uh, began work on that. Um, the year of completion, I would you know, estimate early 70s. I'm not sure of the exact date. I know Franklin Creek was later um, in the uh, early to mid 70s um, was when it was completed. As far as uh, moving floodwaters, I think it's, it's worked out. Um, Franklin Creek particularly was prone to flooding. Um, and that floods into the area what's known as Old Town, which is all very low lying. It all adjoins uh, the salt marsh and historically has always been um, a flood area. You know, typically it was a wetlands in the past. It was a marshy area. The area around St. Joseph Church and Canalino School was formerly Monte Vista Dairy. The reason it was a dairy was because there was pastures, because it was low uh, floodplain, kind of soggy um, uh, grasslands. Um, so uh, the channelization of the creeks, I think, was effective. Of course, it hasn't been a, f um, a good deal for steelhead and, and native species that relied on these creek corridors to reach um, upper mountain waters for, for uh, spawning. Um, so like, like much uh, Army Corps projects, uh, perhaps in the future they might be revisited, um, like San Jose Creek in Goleta has, where fish barriers have been removed, um, calm areas have been built and still allow for uh, fast flow of floodwaters, but also will allow upward migration of fishes. So. I think another advantage of not having channelization is the groundwater can be recharged to the creek bed where it could yeah, except that the whole point, yeah, channelization 99% uh, of the time is not a good deal for anything. Uh, but it's that 1%, it's that 100-year that flood, it's that one time in 100 years that you want it to have that water uh, unimpeded and move as quickly as possible. And, and that's, you know, the, the argument in favor of it. Um, and, and I think that it's been effective, but of course it's just a sterile concrete line ditch now. Uh, David, tell me about the oil spill. Well, again, that was 1969. It was really uh, a one-two punch for Carpinteria. Um, the oil spill followed immediately on the heels of the worst rain that we had seen in, in, in decades. So I think it was January 28th. Um, just two days after the end of the first major uh, storm and flooding, um, January 28, 1969, Union Oil Platform A, which lied just about six miles off the coast, um, was drilling a fifth well. You know, these platforms, offshore platforms, um, drilled multiple wells uh, to tap into the oil reserves. <clears throat> and this was the fifth well being drilled off of that platform. They had just completed drilling to um, its, its completed depth of about, I don't know, it was something over 3,000 feet, but less than 4,000 feet. And in the case of these, they're, they're supposed to be lined, the, the well is to be lined with steel casing and a second casing um, to prevent just this kind of problem. And I, I guess Union Oil uh, had had intended on putting the casings down now that the well was completed, but they were supposed to do it while they drilled the well, and they hadn't done that. So they really violated protocol and uh, what was uh, accepted practices and, and legal at the time. Um, so the well blew out, and it didn't just blow, and I mean, it blew a gusher of oil and gas, but then it also ruptured the seabed, and so every time they would plug the initial drilled well, 
um, it started leaking in other areas. So this went on for uh, about 10 days, I think, that the spill occurred. Um, it, it created huge miles, miles across slick um, out in the Santa Barbara Channel. Uh, uh, can we pause here just a sec? Okay, uh, rolling again. So it ruptured the, f the ground. Yes, yeah, so so every time the the workers and they they had to evacuate. I mean, there there was tremendous amounts of natural gas coming up, and then oil itself is is very explosive and volatile. So um, the risks of explosions and fire were great. So they evacuated everybody from the rig except the essential crew that really were risking their lives to try to cap this thing. They were throwing everything at it from you know I think uh, they had huge steel caps to, you know, pouring tons and tons of concrete down the well uh, uh, head. Um, and they, they slowed it at one point and declared victory. And then a couple days later, um, a well operator, somebody reported to the news press, uh, the company Union Oil was very mum about a lot of this. Um, and then uh, the news press, Santa Barbara news press newspaper, broke the story that it's, it's leaking again. There's another slick appearing. Now, following that, the tremendous f storm uh, of late January, um, typically prevailing winds are northwest and they blow offshore some. And that kept the slick out and away from shore, and for a while people were thinking, oh good, it's gonna break up. Uh, although it did hit the north shore of the Channel Islands and did a lot of devastation out there. And then, uh, while the, the, the oil spill was still occurring, um, a new storm blew in. So by February 4th, a whole nother storm came in. Tremendous storm again, high surf, wind, and it pushed everything back towards shore, um, some reverse uh, eddies or, or um, counterclockwise winds, I think, is what moved it up to Santa Barbara. At first they had booms in place. They thought that they would keep Santa Barbara clear or at least the harbor. Uh, but the oil is sitting on the water. At this point it's six to eight inches thick. Uh, it, the, booms, the booms did not hold. Um, the slick was pushed ashore by February 6th, I believe. Uh, it came ashore in Carpinteria. Um, it, it made landfall or, or harbor fall in Santa Barbara. It just coated all the boats, um, all the beaches in Santa Barbara. It, it started working its way up the coast um, towards Gaviota. It went down as far as Ventura. Uh, and mind you, the beaches were just littered with hundreds of thousands of pounds of debris from these storms. So tree trunks, all the tree trunks and all the storm debris was on the beach. So now you've got oil slick on the beach, you can't just mop it up. It's all coated over all of this, uh, this tremendous debris field um, that stretched from Santa Barbara to Rincon. And in fact, a lot of the debris was still at Rincon by June, six months later, uh, had not dissipated, had not been cleaned up yet. Um, so it, it really was a major, major event that is often credited with um, starting the environmental um, movement in this country. It got national news, certainly got international news as well, but particularly um, played out nationally. Uh, Richard Nixon even um, put a moratorium on any more offshore drilling in federal waters. Um, there was a big push to, and, and all uh, drilling was ceased in the Santa Barbara Channel during this period of time, except for drilling to try to stem the flow from the blowout initially. Um, the, I think over 3,500 seabirds were, were killed, and then it started hitting um, the pinniped rookeries, the sea lions and elephant seals on San Miguel Island were even affected. So it was an ecological uh, disaster that this area had never known. And so this, and then uh, later in mid-February, another huge storm came, so that by the end of February, over 70 inches of rain had fallen in some parts of Santa Barbara County. And Carpinteria was just absolutely um, inundated 
by these two disasters, and and the city itself, um, but representing. Uh, Carpinteria, as it did locally, was able to negotiate with the Army Corps of Engineers to come in and get help. Um, the city was really pretty much on top of it, although, uh, as I think I mentioned, they did have to raise property tax on city residents because the city went broke. This, this was such a devastating um, disaster, these twofold, two-pronged disasters, that the, the city actually went broke and had to levy a property tax to get operating funds to continue to rebuild and, and to maintain services. Well, when you say it went broke, it didn't go bankrupt. It didn't well, no, no, not bankrupt. It ran out of reserves. It, it had more expenses to deal with and it had funds coming in and it knew that um, to rectify this and to try to bring the budget back into balance, um, the city was going to have to do what uh, anti-incorporation people um, were, were worried about and that was to levy a citywide property tax of uh, one dollar per hundred per assessed value. But now this in the city's defense they had to do it. They, they, it, it, it got us through the disasters and then the city lowered property taxes. I think that by um, by the later 70s, it was back down to 65 cents per hundred dollar of assessed value. So the city steadily decreased the property tax um, once reserves were built up and revenues. Uh, the, the city expanded. They annexed uh, the industrial park areas, um, some other neighborhoods that were built uh, during the 70s. So the, the tax base of the city expanded and so city revenues expanded. Um, and they repaid residents by lowering the property tax rate. Uh, so tell me about oil in the area. Uh, well, oil in the area really started back in the 1890s with um, <clears throat> discovery of, of oil reserves in Summerland, so in, within the Carpentaria Valley. And so Summerland experienced an oil boom from Oh, the 1890s through the 1920s when um, a lot of the wells started to play out. They were fairly shallow wells, uh, but once they found oil um, on shore in Summerland, somebody got the bright idea, uh, why stop the well at the edge of the sand? Why not build a wharf and keep drilling for oil underneath the seabed? Um, and so that, that uh, those were the first offshore wells developed in the world. Um, so that started here in Carpinteria Valley. Uh, there was a lot of wild catting and speculation um, and some exploratory wells drilled in Carpinteria proper um, from Rincon and the Bates Ranch uh, out to what is currently the Carpinteria Bluffs. There was a well to right in the middle of what is uh, now the state park. Uh, the oil in this uh, Carpinteria property was really thick, uh, low-grade crude. Um, most of it had degraded to the point of being really liquid asphaltum, which of course was a whole another arm of the petroleum industry that was developed here. But uh, so there were some some um, oil rigs drilled below the bluffs and up on top of the bluffs. But major development really didn't take place until uh, the 1950s when they started going into uh, inshore kind of tidelands areas within, within the state three mile zone um, and, and doing oil uh, exploration. And I think Platform Hogan uh, might have been the first uh, offshore in federal waters platform. So late 50s really is when they started putting in platforms offshore. Um, uh, Humble, Hazel, Hogan, uh, our section of platforms were named with H's. Um, and so uh, the development of oil, uh, they realized that the um, oil bearing strata extended all the way across the channel. And so that's why you see the oil rigs kind of all in line out there. They're following that strata. Um, a lot, many of the inshore rigs within the state three miles have been removed since then. They've, they kind of played out their useful life of 30 to 40 years and uh, were removed, um, I guess, back in the late 90s or early 2000s. Um, 
I'm not sure exactly of the date, but certainly there's been a proposal for expansion. The, the oil is still there. It hasn't all been tapped out. Uh, you know, the Paragon Pros, uh, project from Vinico, proposed by Vinico, would um, utilize uh, slant drilling oil techniques where one could drill a well and can actually reach reserves many miles away from the well site. And so that proposal of, of putting a, a drilling platform onshore at the Vinico property used to be the Standard Oil or Chevron property right behind City Hall uh, would include a derrick of I think uh, 175 some feet uh, initially to drill these wells. Um, I'm not sure how many wells are, are proposed there, but numerous wells. It wouldn't, it's not just one oil well. And they would, they would go out um, under the ocean seabed and tap oil reserves uh, near shore. Um, been tremendous uh, opposition to that, of course. Everything from visuals and aesthetics and sound and noise um, with the development of, of this uh, well but also um, possible contamination or degradation of uh, aquifers. Um, what about a leak? Uh, we've got the seal uh, rookery that's directly offshore as well. It's right adjacent to the Vinico Pier, the Casitas Pier. Um, so uh, the story of oil in this area certainly isn't over. Um, probably until the last drop has been pumped, there will be proposals to, uh, to access the oil. Um, tell me about um, Chevron uh, had a plant. What, what was there before Venico was there? Is the, there have been plants there for a while. Well, it started with Standard Oil of California. Um, and that was back in the late 50s. And I believe it was 1961 um, that they built the tank farm there to... Uh, hold oil that was being produced offshore um, and then was uh, at at one point was barged ashore it was a barge would come and hook up to a pipeline um, off of off the coast here and then pump the oil into the uh, the big tanks that are still out on what's now known as the Vinico property so that was standard oil uh, which later um, became Chevron USA and so it was the Chevron uh, well even when I came here in the 1980s Chevron was still active there uh, Carpinteria City Hall was a former um, Chevron office headquarters for oil production in the area um, so they uh, the city I think it was 1975 when they uh, completed the deal bought what is now City Hall, it was already built. It was built by uh, Chevron um, for their offices. And then the city purchased, Chevron decided they didn't need um, that much administration, I guess, in this area and sold the offices that is currently City Hall today. Um, and so then Chevron pulled out of the area as a lot of the larger oil companies did, um, I guess, in the 1990s or so, um, they were concentrating on you know their 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 international global corporations, and so they were concentrating on developing large reserves in other areas and other explorations. And so uh, the little wells, you know, as much as it affects our day to day life here and the oil, all the platforms offshore and. Um, Really, the production is not that major, and Chevron just divested itself of that. And Vinico was a smaller startup company that, that bought Chevron's interest in some of these wells. And uh, so that's why we have Vinico here today. Um, so uh, what was the next disaster? <laughs> There's always one right around the corner, isn't there? Um, well, following the... Uh, catastrophic floods of January and February 69 and the oil spill of 1969. Uh, just a few years later in, in um, 1971, October, um, early October, uh, was the Romero uh, Canyon fire, which broke out, um, as the name implies, in Romero Canyon behind Montecito, but burned 
uh, eastward um, into Toro Canyon, into all of the backcountry of Carpinteria. It really threatened the entire valley. Um, the entire uh, foothill areas were being burned and the front country of the San Inez Mountains um, was all burned. It, it probably was the biggest fire uh, to occur in Carpinteria uh, in over 50 years. So the chaparral was ripe for, for burning. It was overgrown, a lot of dead undergrowth. Um, and, you know, a fire cycle in Chaparral is every 40 to 50 years, so it was right on time. Uh, so I'm not sure what started the fire, um, but it did, it did burn for a couple of weeks. Uh, it um, burned about 16,000 acres. And the biggest tragedy was they were, uh, they were working all along the foothills to, draw, uh, to build a fire break between the valley floor and remember, the, foot, the foothills were not heavily developed at the time. There weren't nearly the, the, um, the number of ranches. Uh, I mean, there certainly were many ranches, uh, many historic properties, but um, not quite as much uh, subdevelopment in the foothills. So they really were trying to keep the line above Foothill Road. Uh, there was bulldozer operators um, in the Toro Canyon area that were working on this fire break and the winds changed. Toro Canyon is notorious for capricious winds, especially with sundowners. And then when you get the firestorm winds on top of that and a backfire came and enveloped four dozer operators and unfortunately killed four men. Um, that was the biggest loss for the fire uh, in terms of human lives. I think only seven structures were lost, five were homes. Um, the fire at one point completely encircled Kate School and Kate Mesa, but they held the lines um, and nothing was, nothing was touched at Kate. And uh, they finally got a handle on it as it went towards uh, Rincon and got it under control. Um, so that was the big Romero Canyon fire. And now since then, uh, we, well, there was uh, the Wheeler fire started in Ojai and Wheeler Springs and burned back towards Carpinteria. And I know it evacuated areas around Lillingston and Gubernador and again Cape Mesa and the Rincon Canyon area, but didn't, uh, and it was a huge fire, over 200,000 acres, I believe, but didn't really affect Carpinteria too much other than ash fallout. That was in the uh, mid 80s, I believe. So right now, since 1971, we are, uh, what's that, 40? 40 years, 45 years almost, it is right, unfortunately, it is right for another fire in our mountains behind Carpinteria. So, I mean, of course, we have a lot more development that's occurred back there now, um, more recently with the Rancho Monte Alegre and, and large homes going up in that area, very fire prone areas. Um, so, unfortunately, we will experience another, another fire in this foothill area. Um, the, the one that the Romero Canyon fire was a concern that the city of Carpentria might have burned? Well, if uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like the tea fire um, up in Santa Barbara and the Jesuita uh, fire, um, you know, Galita, Santa Barbara areas. I remember after those fires, and those were more recent fires, but huge, huge, uh, devastating fires that everybody was giving their thanks to the avocado ranchers because now the foothills are covered in avocado uh, orchards and that green um, moist area rather than the dry chaparral has kind of uh, helped create a fire break. So the Romero Canyon fire, there certainly were avocado ranches then. There was a fear that it, it might come down into the valley if the winds had changed, but fortunately the winds kept pushing it east. Um, along the foothills and, and didn't really uh, start driving it south towards town. Um, but it certainly was a possibility, you know, that, that would it have gotten uh, across Foothill into some of those, uh, those newer neighborhoods um, up around Santa Monica Road that it, it could have gone into neighborhoods the way the Painted Cave Fire ultimately did in Goleta. Um, I don't know a whole lot about I, that. Just the one sort of Tell me about La Conchita slide. Well, um, 
certainly beyond the, va the boundaries of the Carpenter Valley, but La Conchita residents, I think, relate closely to Carpinteria, even though they're in Ventura County, they're certainly closer to us and, and to um, Rincon Point. And so again, after a period of heavy, heavy rains, um, the land uh, above La Conchita at one point just gave way. And uh, the mud and landslide just came roaring down into town and, and covered up um, buried a number of homes, destroyed and buried a number of homes. Um, and that was the first Lock and Cheetah landslide. A few years later, um, uh, a second slide hit in the same area and with unfortunate loss of life in this case. A number of, of, of people died, one whole family, just about an entire family was wiped out. Um, many beloved uh, Lock and Cheetah residents. It, uh, again, it followed periods of, of heavy, heavy rainfall, so that the ground was just super saturated. I know that there's been controversy um, blaming the ranch above Lock and Cheetah uh, for over-irrigating and perhaps contributing to the moisture level, but truly these, these events happen during periods of, of heavy, heavy rain. Um, after many, many days, and so that, that really is what's super saturated. And in fact, historically, there was an earlier slide um, just a little bit uh, northwest of La Conchita, what's known, what was known as Punta Gorda, um, between Rincon and La Conchita. There was a landslide there about, oh, I don't know, 1910 or sometime back then that actually came down and derailed a, a Southern Pacific train passenger train was knocked off the tracks right there um, before Rincon and thrown down to the beach uh, from a landslide. Was, was that the when the freeway was closed in the 90s, I think, or is that a different story? The, the free, there was a train derailment or train or toxic something or another, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, no, well, the, the La Conchita um, slide closed Highway 101, again, um, cutting Carpinteria off. I mean, people that wanted to get to Carpinteria had to drive um, all the way around. Uh, either they'd had to go up um, five over to 41 and over, or they went 33 um, back way in and into north Santa Barbara County and then down the coast um, for a number of days uh, that, that we were cut off. Focus. David, can you tell me about uh, any landmarks that were uh, dedicated in the last 50 years? Uh, well, shortly after um, City and Corporation, the, the first landmark was dedicated, and that's the Ward Home Torrey Pine, which is right across the street from the museum, across Carpentry Avenue. Uh, it's the largest um, Torrey Pine in the world. Um, I think at the time, of its centennial, it measured 130 feet tall by about 120 feet wide at the crown and about 20 foot circumference. So um, there's a state park devoted to Torrey Pines. They're only native to a La Jolla, a San Diego County area and out on Santa Rosa Island, which is where this seedling came from. And um, those are the only two places in the world that they're native. And so when this seedling was brought over in 1888, and planted here in Carpinteria, the combination of climate, super thick alluvium soil, and, and high water table, you know, resulted in this huge, huge tree. So that was um, declared the first city historic landmark. Um, the second, um, I believe, was the Heath Ranch Park, which is a historic park. Uh, early 70s, they were building a subdivision in a former lemon grove in the, the Heath um, home, what remained of the original Heath mansion from the uh, late 19th century was being demolished and within the walls, the clapboard walls of part of the mansion was found these old adobe walls. So 
it was quickly recognized as probably the oldest uh, adobe structure, the oldest structure left in the Carpenter Valley and the Historical Society negotiated with, with the developers in the city to create, uh, to preserve the, the remaining two walls of the old adobe and create a historic passive uh, park around uh, that. So that was, a, that was the second landmark. And when, when would that a park happened about? Um, the early 1970s. Okay. Um, I think 73, maybe. Um, I think the third official city historic landmark was the palm trees. We, we do palms. I mean, we do trees a lot in Carpinteria. We love our trees. So the, the third landmark was, again, trees, uh, but it was the whole row of palms that fronted the Palms um, Restaurant, what is now the Palms Restaurant. Originally, the Palms Hotel, built in 1912. Uh, so named the Palms because the trees were already there. They were probably left from the White Sulphur Springs Hotel, which was built in the 1890s. So um, when the trees were about 90 years old, they were declared a historic landmark and protected. Unfortunately, um, pink bud uh, rot, which is a fungal infection at the crown of the trees, um, these trees are so old now they're really reaching the end of their lives and most of them are, have uh, died and been cut down. I think there's only three of these original trees left. Um, but that was the third landmark. The fourth landmark was the site of the first branch library in California. Um, and that is uh, the original town hall was the library, the first branch library, and that is where uh, currently um, Senor Frog's restaurant is that became the Masonic building, and that was the second um, kind of community hall building built there. But on that site uh, was uh, in the town hall was held the collection of the Carpenter Literary Society, which became the Women's Club, which started the library and became an official branch uh, in November 1910, which it's credited with being the first branch library in the state. Others claim to be before, but they were, uh, like San Inez, I think, was a couple of months later. Once Branch Library, once the um, legislation was passed to create Branch Libraries from a Maine County public library, um, you know, many small communities followed suit. Uh, uh, do you know about when that... Okay, so uh, what was the date of the dedication of the first of, of that land? The the branch library land? Uh, it was officially Carpinteria City Historic Landmark number four uh, in September 1977. And then it was quite a while. Um, we worked on getting uh, the portal of Sycamore back to a tree again. <laughs> um, what, what do you mean? It was not a tree? Or? It, no, that, well, the library site's not a tree, but then the next landmark, number five, oh, is tree. the portal of Sycamore, which is another tree. Uh, we love our big trees here. Well, we have historic trees, you know? I mean, the Torrey Pine, the biggest in the world. Uh, the portal of Sycamore uh, is purported to be over 400 years old. Uh, and the oral tradition holds that it, it was it's the last among the grove of sycamores where the Chumash were building a tomal when the Portola expedition came in August of 1769. And whereas the priest named this area San Roque, always after a saint, um, the soldiers uh, were really impressed with the Chumash um, tomal canoe construction. and with this canoe being constructed, um, said, well, this place is a carpenter shop, La Carpinteria. And so that's the name that stuck. Um, that's how we got our name, La Carpinteria. And so the Portal of Sycamore is really dedicated in remembrance of that and probably pretty accurately close to the area uh, in which the Chumash were uh, constructing their canoes because they have access to um, Carpentery Creek, the lagoon at the creek mouth, and um, uh, the asphalt deposits used for caulking and such. And about what year would that have been dedicated? Uh, the Portal of Sycamore is in 1993. Okay. And then we did a historic site. We couldn't get full landmark status um, for the old airport hangar, which is Costa's Auto Body Works. You know, it is private property, and and with uh, when you 
designate something a historic landmark, it, it does restrict um, uh, activities, uh, actions, redevelopment, removal, trimming in the case of trees. Uh, it, it can tie the hands of a property owner. And so, uh, but we did want to recognize the importance of the um, early aviation history back in the 20s and the site of the uh, Chadbourne Donzi Airport, which really locally was known as the Carpenter Airport, which was famous for Lindbergh flying in and out of and a, and a number of other notables and the Bauhaus brothers' uh, contributions to aviation history and, and um, airplane uh, fuselage design and development in the early 20s. So in trying to recognize all of this, the site uh, of Costa's Auto Body Shop, which used to be Baylor Tractor Sales, which was actually the hangar for the old airport back in the late 20s, early 30s. Um, the, the airport pretty much um, closed down in the mid 30s when the Santa Barbara Airport was developed out in Goleta. But we recognize this with a historic marker. So it's a historic site and historic landmark sorts. Um, and that's out right before City Hall at the corner of Dump Road and Carpenter Avenue. Um, and that also was in the 1990s. And then uh, Tar Pits Park uh, is an official landmark number six. And that's the final landmark uh, that's received city designation. Um, and that encompasses uh, the area between the Vinico or the Casitas Pier and the east end of the state park, state beach park. Um, and so all of that bluff top was generously donated to the city uh, by Chevron. Uh, one of Carpentry's former mayors, Tom Lewis, uh, was a former Chevron employee, and he really negotiated with his, his former company. And uh, wearing the mayor's hat, I think at the time for Carpinteria, um, got Chevron to, to donate that, that large part coastal bluff property. Um, and since that was the site of uh, natural um, asphalt pools and seeps and the site of asphalt mining, uh, historic um, asphalt mining in the area, the entire park is designated as a historic landmark. So I know there's the song, uh, Santa Claus is coming to town, but in our case, Santa Claus leaving town. Yeah, I remember all of that. In fact, uh, the Daily Show, John Stewart Daily Show, uh, got a hold of me here, oh, really? and we filmed an interview um, with uh, I forget who now. Somebody I think from Pearl Chase Society who was behind trying to save Santa. Um, is is that available? That do you have a copy? Of that I there? don't. I don't have a copy of that. It, uh, they wanted to put me on the spot, but I knew how the Daily Show operated, and then I thought, well, I, I think I'll just maintain my decorum and reputation and just stay out of the fray. I mean, I was I entered into the fray because obviously with the Historical Society, um, people ask us to weigh in on the Santa Claus issue, and you know, for your viewers, the Santa Claus issue was: do we keep a forty foot tall? Um, chicken wire, plaster, paper mache, uh, Santa Claus um, along Highway 101. You know, it used to be um, Old Pacific Coast Highway, which is now Carpentry Avenue, and the highway ran what what developed uh, out west of town into Santa Claus Lane was originally an oil uh, orange juice stand, and uh, and there, there's a gas station, I think, and people weren't really pulling over, you know, they'd just been through Carpinteria where there was cafes and numerous gas stations, filling stations and such. So, and this is the late 1940s, um, the McKeans owned the property and the orange juice stand and they decided, I don't know, maybe it was Christmas time at the time, but somebody doffed a a uh, Santa Claus suit and went out and started waving at cars to come by and stop, you know, and get to the orange and have orange juice and snacks. And the, the stand expanded. Um, that was kind of the birth of it. And it, it developed into what became Santa Claus Lane um, with famous date shakes. And it was Christmas theme year round and uh, the toy store 
and uh, there was a, an antique shop, there was a miniature train ride, there was a little petting zoo, um, there was all sorts of kitschy road, it was a kitschy roadside attraction. And all the while Santa Claus sat on this rooftop um, waving to passers-by on, on the highway. Well, in the, in the later 50s, um, the freeway was created, and then in the 60s it was redone again. And it really bypassed Santa Claus Lane. And so um, it, it did warn an off-ramp and a name of its own. So it has a, the Santa Claus Lane off-ramp. Um, so tourists could still go to it, but it wasn't so easy to stop, not when you're flying by at 65 miles an hour. So unless you knew it was there. And a lot of people did. They, they would visit it every year, you know, on their way up and down the coast or their summer vacation in Carpinteria or up to Pismo Dunes or what have you. They'd stop at Santa Claus Lane. And it was really a beloved attraction that by the 1980s was kind of falling on hard times. Um, a lot of the shops had closed. The, the candy store uh, and um, remained open under a different owner, I believe. Uh, the toy store remained open. Um, some other gift shops and, and other businesses had been developed, um, but they just weren't really getting the traffic. And so a new uh, owner um, in the 90s wanted to get rid of Santa Claus, just completely change the name to Patero Lane, really continue that uh, theme of Padaro and you know the posh homes along that section and develop a retail um, and per and some uh, restaurants no doubt um, to uh, attract a different clientele let's say so the the train had been closed for a while since the 80s uh, I'm sorry I'm gonna pick it